It's being called the end of Hong Kong as we know it. Beijing extends the long arm of its law over the former British colony. Will these new measures help protect the city or be used to crush all dissents? I'm Ali Aslan and today's newsmaker is Hong Kong's national security law. One analyst describes Hong Kong as falling behind a new Iron Curtain. Arrests and detentions began as soon as the new national security law came into effect. Within hours, pro-democracy groups disbanded and activists began fleeing the territory, including a guest we'll be speaking to later in this show. Beijing says it will return stability to a city beset by protests, but activists fear the law's ambiguous language will be applied to stifle any criticism of the government. So, is this the end of the road for pro-democracy activism there? And has Hong Kong society changed forever? Adam Platz reports. Hong Kong's new security law came into effect on July the 1st, following months of pro-democracy demonstrations in the special administrative region. Imposed by Beijing, it criminalizes acts of subversion, succession, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces, with sentences up to life in prison. It will only target an extremely small minority of people who have breached the law, while the life and property, basic rights and freedoms of the overwhelming majority of Hong Kong residents will be protected. July the 1st was also the 23rd anniversary of Hong Kong's handover from the UK to China. Traditionally a day of protest against mainland rule, over 300 arrests were made on the law's first day of implementation, nine under the new legislation. On July the 5th, books considered seditious by Beijing were removed from public libraries. Hong Kong's police chief has pledged his full support to the new law, and his officers have been given sweeping new powers, including the right to search private premises without a warrant. Of course, we can understand you know, that we may be the target. And of course, you know, we do not want to go through uh, the secret police interrogation, go through jail. But I think we have to psychologically prepare for that, since, as I've said, we will be continue our activity, uh, you know, to confront the national security law. Demonstrations have continued, sometimes attempting to protest by means that don't break the new laws. But some protest leaders have fled Hong Kong fearing extradition to mainland China. The UK has offered residents leading to citizenship to up to three million potential British national overseas passport holders and their families, provoking a threatening response from China. So we want to be your friend. We want to be your partner. But if you want to make China a hostile country, you have to bear the consequences. And as tensions rise between China and the US, Hong Kong has been drawn into the crosshairs. Free Hong Kong was one of the world's most stable, prosperous, and dynamic cities. Now, now it will be just another communist-run city where its people will be subject to the party elite's whims. The US Congress has unanimously voted to place sanctions on banks and individuals that participate in what the legislation describes as China's oppression of Hong Kong. As the effects of this law are felt, is the city now essentially under mainland rule in all but name? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. Well, to debate the new law and its impact, we are joined by Lo Ken He. He's the vice chairman of Hong Kong's Democratic Party. And in Beijing is China Affairs analyst Chu Qingdou. Welcome to both of you. Chu Qingdou. Uh, Great Britain handed uh, Hong Kong back to China in 1997 under the One Country, Two Systems Agreement, which provided autonomy to Hong Kong for at least 50 years. Doesn't this new security law de facto end this agreement, de facto end the One Country, Two Systems provision and understanding? Uh, no, on the contrary, it actually reinforces the One Country, Two Systems 
because you know before the law came into effect, before the law came into being, over the past year we have seen is uh, violence, you know, firebombing of the police headquarters, you know, attacks of uh, the government offices, and uh, even bystanders, innocent bystanders, will be pawned with gasoline and burned almost to death. This is much more than the normal uh, exercise of freedom of expression. This is a, a you know bordering basically terrorist activities. And also you're seeing the interference, collusion between some of the activists, so-called, with Washington and with London, uh, basically to try to separate Hong Kong from China or make Hong Kong become a land of anti-China uh, places, you know, the center of anti-China here in China. So of course you have to do something to make sure. Remember, people often stress two systems, but also the it seems that we have lost uh, Xu King Do there due to a connection. So let me bring in Lo King Hei at this particular point and give you a chance to respond. What you uh, just heard, uh, he says, no, this does not de facto end the one uh, country, two systems agreement struck with Great Britain back in 1997. Do you agree? Well, uh, I think it is a very, very harsh uh, attempt to crush the one country, two systems that is uh, enshrined in the basic law and in the Sino-British Joint Declaration. Uh, just now, the other guest said uh, the Hong Kong people has been protesting and there are a lot of chaos in, in the last year. Yes, it is. But uh, I think everybody should have know uh, what caused that uh, kind of uh, chaos. Uh, it is the government that who pushed for an extradition law from Hong Kong to China that makes Hong Kong people afraid and that makes Hong Kong people frightened that their freedom will be gone. So I think we have to look at the cause of the problem. And actually, for the for the for the for the last year, the government had a lot of chances to actually calm down the society. For example, we asked them to uh, set up an independent inquiry uh, into the police brutality uh, as early as last June, but. The government just didn't do that, and, and a lot of people are just uh, very angry of that. And, and now they're putting another more draconian, um, more evil uh, national security law into Hong Kong. So I, I think the problem for Hong Kong people now is that uh, we face a lot of uh, dangers, we, f uh, we face a lot of uh, risk, uh, but I think most of the Hong Kong people, their faith and their resilience will go on. The resilience and the protests uh, will go on, says Lo King. Hey, Xu King Do, if we look at the new security law and at the provisions and the details of it, obviously it gives greater uh, jurisdiction to Beijing in national security matters and cases in Hong Kong. So basically, Hong Kong's jurisdiction, Hong Kong common law no longer applies or at least is being undermined and takes a back seat here, no? Uh, no, uh, absolutely but the majority number of cases will be you know, investigated, prosecuted, and also tried in Hong Kong. So basically, under the law, uh, the central government is authorizing the Hong Kong government, of course, is the legislative uh, organ, to deal with the national security issue. And now you are basically drawing a red line, what you can do, what you cannot do. So this is really about national security here. If people call national security as evil, and then that reflects the problem here. I mean, national security, you know, in other words, China could do is that, uh, could bypass all the lawmaking. They can simply impose whatever regulations because Hong Kong is part of China. National security is for the whole nation. It's not only for Hong Kong. But no, China did not do that. China did, in, you know, following the lawmaking process out of respect of one country, two systems and leave it to Hong Kong. You know, uh, only with exception of a three uh, exceptional situations uh, that are special circumstances in which you know, Hong Kong is not able to handle. So, yes, the central government will get involved. Otherwise, it's really about Hong Kong. I think no one disputes that Hong Kong is uh, part of China, no, neither on the show nor even internationally. But the opening, say, of a national security office in Hong Kong, placing Chinese agents for the first time in Hong Kong, of course, is a quite controversial move and does send a threatening and clear message that we are, meaning Beijing, we are from now on under control. Why is this necessary? Does Beijing not trust Hong Kong to enforce these laws? 
Yeah, as as I uh, pointed earlier, probably because of the poor connection. Uh, you know, some of the opposition uh, uh, leaders, for example, they flew to Washington, you know, Nancy Pelosi or, or Vice President Pence, uh, joined the congressional hearing, even urged Washington to impose sanctions on Hong Kong, on China. In normal countries, this kind of behavior is called treason. Okay? Can you imagine in Washington, Nancy Pelosi, fly to Moscow and met and meet join, uh, Vladimir Putin and ask Putin to impose sanctions on Washington? That's just impossible. That's in, uh, unacceptable in any normal society. You have to draw a line. I can imagine without national security law, the opposition, some of them, will receive funding, will, con will even to be trained by Washington or to be armed by Washington and then make Hong Kong probably another Libya, another Syria. Uh, so. China does not want to see that. For the goodness of Hong Kong, for the welfare of Hong Kong people, you have to draw the line. You have to protect the stability and the peace in Hong Kong so prosperity will continue in Hong Kong. L Hong Kong is part of China. Let's give, That's let, China let's give Lo King Hei. Let's, let's give, absolutely. Let's, let's give Lo King Hei here a chance to respond. Uh, does any of the arguments that uh, Chu King Do put forth here, does any of those convince you? Do any of those arguments resonate with you? Uh, no, not really. Uh, for a lot of Hong Kong pro-democracy figures, uh, we have been saying that uh, until we have the universal suffrage that is uh, promised in the basic law, in, in, in our basic law, uh, we can discuss about the national security law that is in the past already. So uh, I think it, uh, he's not making a frank judgment or a frank comment on the pro-democracy side. And for the other part, I think, if you're talking about a normal country, a normal country, if you're, for example, in the United States, if you talk about, you just talk about independence of certain states, or California, or, or in, in UK, uh, they have a referendum on, on the Scotland as well. But in Hong Kong, when you're just flying a flag that said Hong Kong independence, that will make you uh, now get arrested. So this is the draconian law. This is the, the evil part that the law is, is, is having in Hong Kong. And we know the history and we know the track record of the Chinese regime. Uh, whenever they have the law and whenever the law is written that they have the power to do anything, they will do that. They will do that anything. They will crush the democracy. They will crush the freedom of Hong Kong people. Hong Kong people has been a very, very a calm and very pragmatic people for the past 23 years. And you have never seen Hong Kong people uh, fighting so hard uh, in, 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 in 20 years. So what is the problem here is that the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese regime is trying to erode the one country, two systems, to erode the freedom of Hong Kong people. And the freedom and the Hong Kong people just stand up and say, Come on, we have to have one country, two system back. There are a lot of people are still talking about that uh, for the past year. It is not just independence. You are not. You, you should not just have a broad brush and say, "Oh, someone fly a flag of United States and someone fly a flag of." United Kingdom and someone fly a flag that said Hong Kong independence. So it is an independence movement. This is totally wrong. Su King Do, uh, if we're listening to Lo King Hei as I do, as you do, clearly he's not convinced by your arguments. There's still concern on the part of uh, himself and uh, those affiliated with him. How do you alleviate those concerns? At the end of the day, Hong Kong, you say, is part of China, meaning he's, he's your citizen as well. Well, you know, you can ask a question, you know, why uh, having China, you know, done anything in terms of national security and waited for 23 years to make such a law. Uh, you know, before, in the past 23 years, you can say one country, two systems, um, you know, functioned very well until last year. Uh, so, you know, the, the, in the sense, China was forced to do something to make sure the future of Hong Kong will be stable, will be peaceful, and will be prosperous. And if you can let the issue continue to fester like what happened the, uh, last year. You can imagine Hong Kong will become a battleground. Situation will be worse. Businessmen will be leaving Hong Kong. 
capital will be in the USD capital flight out of Hong Kong to Singapore to other places in Asia probably. So that's the end of Hong Kong. I'm not sure what Washington is doing. And also because of the geopolitical uh, competition between uh, China and the United States, Hong Kong is being used as a card to play against China. Hong Kong is not like Scotland. Nobody is interfering in the British affairs there, remember? And uh, the situation is different. Uh, we know what happened to Libya, Syria, as long as the U.S. Right. intervened. So, Hingo, you, you, you said that these you said that these laws, these new security laws, uh, are there to, and first and foremost, to maintain and preserve stability and make sure that Hong Kong continues to prosper. But isn't the, the opposite the case? At the end of the day, Hong Kong is no longer seen as the thriving global financial center. As a matter of fact, it's now seen with these new draconian measures, it is seen as yet just another communist Chinese city. Isn't that correct? No, no, you are wrong. Absolutely not. Uh, How so? Explain it to me. if you take a look at the market, actually you see a strong rise in the stock market. If you talk to the business people, they are waiting for the law because that will provide certainty. Nobody likes chaos. Nobody likes the violence, remember? And you know, people talk about the police brutality in Hong Kong. That's a farce. That would be ridiculous compared to what happened in, in Washington, say. You know, people say, I can't breathe. They can be killed by the knee of the policeman. Who was killed in Hong Kong? Any protester was killed in Hong Kong? So the law was not targeting Hong Kong people, was not even targeting a Hong Kong opposition party, was targeting a very few group of people who colluded with Washington, who colluded with London. And to destabilize the situation, of course, they should be fearful, probably. Yes, there's, there's justifiable. But for the absolute majority of Hong Kong people, there's no reason to fear. When I go to any other country, I don't care about the national security law because I'm, I follow the law. I observe the law. Locking, hey, uh, I want to bring you in here at this particular point because obviously there is international outrage. Uh, Great Britain and the U.S., Xu uh, Kingdo has already mentioned their reaction to it. The U.S. has passed the bipartisan uh, bill in Congress uh, in, in fact, condemning this move and threatening sanctions. Great Britain went so far as to say they're going to offer residency, if not even possible, citizenship to three million Hong Kongers. What do you hope uh, moving forward? How do you think... Uh, from your point of view and those who will stand with you, how is the situation going to evolve in the next few weeks and months? Uh, first of all, I would like to respond a little bit on what he said just now because uh, I think this is the mentality, I have to point out that this is the mentality of the Chinese regime, that when there is a uh, protest and when there is some dissatisfaction from the people they govern, they just crush them. Hong Kong people has been asking the government to make concessions, asking the government or the leader to step down because one-fourth of the Hong Kong population went out to the street to protest against something that she put out. In a normal country, as he said always, in a normal country, one-fourth of a population that went to the street, the government is gone. The head of the government is gone and the government must have some concession. But the Hong Kong government, they didn't have any concessions. And with the police brutality, uh, we have no police being investigated or arrested in Hong Kong for the past one year. And if you're comparing with the United States, the policeman is charged with murder, if you want to compare with the United States. But uh, answering your question, I think uh, Hong Kong people were still looking at the law. Uh, of course, there are a lot of worries and a lot of problems that we have. Uh, but, but now I can see uh, there's a kind of a censorship, a white terror that has already begun. Uh, some journalists, they said they are, they are trying to censor themselves already because they don't know where the red line is. They don't know how uh, they will be punished by the law. Uh, so I think the situation it is bad. Uh, even even though there is a lot of international response from, from, from international community. But I think the, the, the situation in Hong Kong is still bad. But uh, uh, even though the protests or you may see less people on the street because some people are afraid of that because the Chinese is ruling by fear, uh, I think Hong Kong people, the resilience, our mind, our mentality will still be fighting against the 
national security law. And we believe that uh, making concessions, uh, the government making concessions to Hong Kong people and to allow Hong Kong to prosper is the way to go. It is not to crush the international city into, into just another Chinese city. Well, certainly listening to both of you, not much uh, mutual ground uh, here. So certainly this controversy and uh, the, the uh, resistance uh, will continue. Xu King Zhou and Lo King Hei, thank you so much for uh, joining us and for providing some insights into the debate. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, we are joined by Nathan Law. He's the former chairman of the now disbanded pro-democracy party Demosisto. He was jailed for his role in the Umbrella Movement protests and he fled Hong Kong after the national security law came into effect. Nathan Law, welcome to the show. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to have you. You listened uh, to the previous conversation that I just had with both Chu Xin Do and Lo King. Hey, obviously you fled Hong Kong since the new national security law was implemented. You are now at an undisclosed uh, location. You're trying to, uh, if you will, uh, trying to steer the debate in your favor now from outside of Hong Kong. Um, how, how optimistic are you that you're going to succeed? Well, um, I think uh, from now on, my responsibility is to provide uh, an angle uh, on the international advocacy work that you cannot do in Hong Kong, basically, because the national security law is written in such a vague and broad term. Even you have advocacy for the foreign uh, governments to hold China accountable. They, uh, these acts will possibly be seen as breaching the law. So it is definitely holding a sword on every Hong Kongers head and possibly like spreading the politics of fear and white terror. Clearly, you uh, feared for your own safety and security. Uh, uh, that's why you left, no? Well, yes, of course, this is part of the concern. But the other uh, major impetus of my move is that I do believe for now we need a public figure on the international national level to really elaborate what uh, harms or what uh, dangers that uh, the national security law imposed to Hong Kong. So you stepped down from the Demosisto party, which you obviously co-founded uh, with uh, Joshua Wong. Is the party, is the movement still alive and kicking? Well, the movement is uh, definitely still alive. Uh, you can see uh, there were more than 100,000 people marching down to the street on the very first day of the implementation of the national security law. You can see that people were persistent and they are tenacious and they are ready to fight even though they need to face years of imprisonment under such a draconian law. Obviously, international pressure here uh, is part of your strategy and is part of the solution, perhaps, but it can also backfire. No, China, Beijing has already made it clear that they don't want any interference whatsoever from outside countries. Well, I think uh, this should be uh, the case that China, Beijing, they have to review themselves. The so-called sanction, for example, the cancellation of the preferential treatment is because the world recognized that Hong Kong is not autonomous anymore. If you are not no different from China, so why should the world give you preferential treatment? And that is the case. China has failed to convince the world that Hong Kong is autonomous and it is not just another Chinese city. So I think uh, this is something that China has to rethink its policy and is very assertive or even aggressive diplomatic measures made them into the difficulties that they are facing now. Beijing, of course, will beg to differ in this particular case, saying Hong Kong is part of China, it is ours, and therefore uh, telling uh, Pompeo or Donald Trump, we don't interfere uh, in your matter. So uh, do you see any potential for success here that international pressure will actually lead to the desired outcome? Well, we should not clamp down the freedom of speech just because of the authoritarian narrative from China. And as a Hong Kong citizen, I'm entitled to really line out that the international community should hold China accountable. It's not only about Hong Kong, it's about concentration camp in Xinjiang, military intimidation in Taiwan, and also the arguments in South China Sea. And I, and we could, of course, see that China has been very aggressive in this issue. And in Hong Kong, they have promised Hong Kong people autonomy and democracy, and they failed to, uh, well, commit into their promise for more than 23 years. And the demands of Hong Kong people are legitimate and just very humble to ask China to do, they, to do what they have promised. 
Many analysts out there do perceive this new security law, which now just has been implemented as the de facto end of the uh, one country, two systems rule, the de facto end of Hong Kong's autonomy, saying this is the final coffin of the place of Hong Kong as we knew it. Uh, would you agree? Well, uh, I think uh, the setup of secret police agency and uh, um, uh, national security agency in Hong Kong means that uh, China has stepped in to uh, or exercise its comprehensive autocratic control in Hong Kong, and this is completely violate the core um, core cornerstone of uh, one country two system, which that the two system could govern itself, could enjoy high degree of autonomy. So, well, basically, the one country two system is that. What gives you hope? Well, I think there are Hong Kong citizens, even though they are facing grave risk, but they still resist, persist. And I think this is something that gives us hope. We have not given up and we will not give up. We have not given up and we will not give in, giving up, says Nathan Law. Thank you so much for joining us on this program. And thank you all out there for you, of course, for watching us. Thank you for tuning in and hope to see you all again next time when we come back to you with a new edition of Newsmakers.